Hi, uh, my name is Matt Perez, and you're in the Heart Art Hatchery Live show. Uh, well, it's a podcast, so I don't know if it's a show or not. But um, we're going to be talking to Jennifer Johnson, and uh, my partner, Jose Leal, is so always oh, in the little windows. There you go. <laughs> there's my partner, Jose Leal, and there's Jennifer, and uh, this is the conversation. It's not scripted. Um, and uh, we're going to find out who Jennifer is and what she does and, and then how it fits with the framing of the non-fiat world and, and if, it, if there is a framing. So, Jennifer, nice to have you here. Uh, so tell us a bit about yourself. Well, it's uh, very nice to be here. And um, I've watched quite a few of your podcast shows and um, quite impressed uh, with the array of people that you talk to and the types of conversations. And last week with, uh, with Fernanda was quite interesting. Um, all right. My name is Jennifer uh, L. Johnson, and I'm a narrative strategist. I'm also a communication activist, and uh, I am a lobbyist as well. And I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Story Mine Inc. Now, I say CEO because I want to take back that term for women as well. Uh, because being a female CEO in a, the sea of, of male CEOs is quite a challenge. So I like to say that. Um, our company, StoryMind Inc., um, is a company, uh, a team of people, multicultural, cross-cultural. Uh, what we do is we help organizations, um, companies, businesses, communities construct narrative, construct, create story, narrative. Um, and we do this using uh, a method, which is our method called the storyboard method. And it's a series of tools, thinking tools, that uh, in the laboratories that we offer, um, help people step by step construct a narrative, a story uh, about a particular theme that they need to transmit uh, to others. And the reason that uh, we have this company in the first place is because narrative and story shape our world. And, and that, that's a powerful thing to think about, just that. Narrative yeah. and story shape our world, shape our minds yes. and actions. Uh, and narrative is us often invisible. I would say 99% you know, of the narratives that are in our minds, in our heads, because they don't float around in the ether, that they're in our brains, um, are unconscious, they're, they're invisible. So one of the radical, to use the, the, your name, um, one of the, the radical qualities of our organization and, 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 and what we do is that we also help make narratives visible. When we teach people how to or co-create with people their narratives, their stories, we're also helping them see that narrative exists and make visible the narratives that are around them or in their heads and maybe they're in the side of the company and inside of society, inside of their home, inside of their community. And uh, so that's also a part of it. And I think we're probably going to get into that a little bit later. Um, so Jennifer, I, I want to yeah. pause you right there. because Please do. What you've just described for me makes all the sense in the world. I wonder how you got there. So tell us the story of how narratives became so important to you that, that you created a, an organization and a, and a framework for it. How did that come about? What was the impetus for that? Okay, that's a great question. Let me try to give you the really short answer. Uh, short answer because it's you know, a lifelong process. Um, so let's see. Um, okay. 
I've always been, I I'm, I'm, was born in Texas. I now live in Barcelona. That's where I live and, 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 and love and work from Barcelona. Um, born in the United States in Texas. And I've always been very attracted to, to, to discourse, to, to language, to text. And uh, when I wrote my thesis in, 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 in university, analyzing uh, fascist propaganda and applying it to some of the presidential discourses that were being emitted at the times. And um, just very naturally and organically started analyzing discourse around me. I wasn't using the word narrative then. And uh, at that time, uh, HIV uh, AIDS started becoming um, a worldwide epidemic and I moved to Barcelona and I saw, and I've been, uh, well, let's say I was sort of born an activist. Yeah, I think that, I think that, and you probably ask, if I asked my parents, you know, they would probably say, yeah, oh God, you know, when she was two years old, she didn't stop asking questions and why. So I, um, I became very involved in the HIV AIDS epidemic as an activist uh, because there was a lot of things that were uh, not helping people and, and, and hundreds of thousands of people were dying. And uh, I saw very quickly that the story that was being told about HIV AIDS in that time, you know, we're talking like 25, 30 years ago, that time was full of stigma and it was the wrong story and it was not going to help people to, to heal, to live. Uh, I was going to actually probably cause them more difficulty and, and even death. And so I started to research and write a new story, uh, joined an organization that I half built and started to rewrite the story of, of HIV for, so, in order that people living with it could understand what it was and also the press could understand differently and then the government because they asked for some of the information that I was developing. And so I saw firsthand how reconstructing a narrative, a reconstructing a story could actually save people's lives, how powerful that was. And then I went to work in the United States again as a lobbyist, and I did the same thing uh, as a lobbyist for health legislation. And again, to help pass a $2 billion legislation package of discretionary funding. George Bush was president, wasn't exactly, um, was, wasn't exactly a friend of public health care spending. And we constructed as lobbyists, um, constructed narrative to for their frame of thinking in order so to, 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 to activate their reality and values in order to pass the legislation that we needed to be passed. Again, I saw constructing narrative with your audience in mind is very powerful and uh, it makes changes and it's the catalyst of change and, and, and I think it's the essence of change. So I came back to Barcelona because I really miss Barcelona, really miss Europe after being in Washington. It's a very tough, very wonderful place to work. It's very, very, very hard to work in politics in Washington. It's very demanding. Uh, and after these experiences, realized that people needed a method. Uh, I was seeing a method emerge before my very eyes because I'd used it in different environments and, and it very much worked to bring forth change. So we built a method. Uh, with a couple of years, with a little bit of a think tank, with uh, a couple of years, and tested it, iterated it, and then started teaching this method. That's the method that we use. And I don't really call it storytelling because there's a lot of baggage. Well, there's a lot of baggage in, in Europe. People say, talk about storytelling, and um, it has different types of meaning. It could just mean telling an anecdote. So I like to use story and narrative. Um, because it's about a process of creation. It's about a process of thinking, creation, and, and the key, the key. And then I'll be quiet. <laughs> the key. Well, I, is... I just want to ask a question before you jump to the but key. No, I'm just going to say just the one key. Second. One okay. second. Just one second. Uh, <laughs> you said, I just want to be clear that, that our audience and I understand what you just said. Story in narrative. Is that story what you're and narrative? And 
and yeah. thank you. Story thank and you. narrative. Okay, yes. And please, uh, yes, I, it must be clear because Clarity is my middle name. Um, <laughs> um, the key for creating narrative is creating meaning, shared meaning. Okay, so, so if we're going to define narrative in a clear, uh, simple way, um, narrative and story are ideas that are put together into a frame for seeing, for understanding, for building meaning, for shaping meaning with a particular audience, with a particular public, with a particular group of people in mind. Okay? So, so that's the way we define narrative and creating shared meaning is the essence. Intentionally creating meaning, right? And, and, and when you deconstruct the narratives that are around you, um, you're seeing that how, what, what the meaning is. And if you decide to sh change and shift or create or recreate a narrative, then you need to create new meaning. But if you're gonna take somebody's story or narrative away, you need to replace it with another one. That's very important. Okay, I said it was gonna be quiet. <laughs> I got a question for you, because the, the other part, the follow is, is, is matching what you said, or trying to fit what you said into the framing of the non-fiat approach, the radical approach and all that, which is something at the beginning that did it for me. When you said narratives are you know, you can't see, they're invisible. And um, what we claim is that the fiat environment, the environment that we live in, is invisible. It's a huge narrative. Everything has to do with that. Um, th so that's one, one aspect of it. The other thing you just mentioned again about the shared meaning at the bottom, uh, at the beginning of everything we do is meaning and belonging. Those are those are two things. And so shared meaning is very important. Belonging is very important. Um, so so how, do, how do we make the fiat environment visible to people? I mean, that I, we use this, this gadget mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to... to uh, I got my glasses on. We used to sketch it to, uh, to kind of get the idea across that you, you walk around like this and then you lift it and it looks different and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, it's fun and the, and the glasses are actually cool and all that stuff, but um, it doesn't quite do the trick. So how do, how, how do you make something that's invisible visible? Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, it's a great question, and I and I love your glasses, and I think it's a great metaphor. If you give me um, your address, I'll send you a pair. <laughs> no, don't say that if you don't mean it, because I you, no, I, mean, I, lo I love glasses, man. I walk around with those in Barcelona and be the coolest. I can just I, see. He but will yeah? send you. He will send you a pair. Oh, yeah. I'm so excited. Okay, great. All right. So, the, good question. All right, there's a couple of there's a couple of ways to approach this uh, this question is that one way of making a uh, narrative visible is first mm -hmm. of all by talking about narrative and letting people know and helping them see, which is one of the things that I do um, as, a, as an educator, as an activist, as a professional, is to, to help people recognize and realize that the, 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 the way their behavior, the decisions that they make, the way they would see themselves, the way they interact in the environments around them have to do with the stories that are in their heads that circulate in society, but they, they, they are inside of our minds. As one of, George Lakoff is, is, is one of my, my, my dear um, teachers. Uh, uh, he's a cognitive linguist. And he says, uh, ideas don't live in the air. They're not floating in the air. They are nerve circuits inside of your head. And when you understand that, uh, you can also address that when you're helping people to understand new ideas. So that's one thing, is just becoming conscious by speaking about narrative and just sort of like giving that word and a visibility. Another way 
okay. to to make the the narratives uh, to show the the invisibility or make them visible is to start creating new ones that you want to use to replace or to shed light on the ones that are powerful and invisible. Now, now that is what I do with people and organizations um, every day. And sometimes it's for uh, a company, some, uh, a, 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 a large company. Sometimes it's for a small company. Sometimes it's for an NGO. Sometimes it's for a foundation. Sometimes it's for a community. Sometimes it's for a group of activists, okay? Work across the board with lots of different, because they're people. They're people working in teams. They're people that are hungry for new ways of thinking. So okay. you build a narrative, okay? Let's say you build a narrative about fiat thinking. When you build that narrative carefully uh, with your audience in mind, the people who you really want to create meaning with, yeah, with your particular audience in mind, because you never build a narrative for everyone. It doesn't exist. The general public doesn't exist. That's something that I, I, I think it's, I always am trying to, to, to demystify immediately. It's like the, the general, there's no such thing as a general public. Yeah. So when you create for a specific audience about fiat thinking, you guys, yeah, then when you do that, if you do it carefully and define with clarity, what that means, even maybe the origin of that term and help them understand and help them see it, that will be immediately juxtaposed with the other invisible narratives and people will begin to see more clearly through a new lens. Let's just take your metaphor, uh, yeah? But through a new lens and that new lens is a narrative lens and that narrative lens allows people then to see more clearly, oh, I never thought about that, or I never even thought about, let's say, fiat. I think it's fascinating. And I had to look up all this information about fiat because I, I, I was feeling a little bit, I don't know, unintelligent or something because I couldn't quite understand it. And I, I did a whole bunch of research on it, and I read it, and I'm fascinated by the term. And I'm fascinated about, you know, how and its evolution with money. And, and I think that could be a great thing for you guys to include in your narrative to help people understand. Uh, your notions of of, of, of of fiat thinking. So that's those are two ways, you know, to, to, to make the invisible visible. Creating new narratives is a very powerful way to make the old narratives visible. Okay. So when you talk about the, the, the swapping lenses, <clears throat> I like to think uh, of that metaphor less about a new lens and more about an old lens in that um, the way that we see that story, uh, you know, the, the non fiat, the, the radical story is not one of a new set of ideologies replacing the old set of ideologies. That is the fiat, the, the fiat uh, thinking but one that is born of us, one that comes from how we feel about each other, how we need one another through our, our meaning and our belonging. And, and that to me is a narrative that's a little different. It's a narrative about connecting to who we really are rather than something that is a, a yet another creation of, of the story. It's a story in of itself. It's just a story about who we are rather than a story of who we could be assuming some other ideology. Does that make sense to you? Do you see where I'm trying to go there? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I think that one of the things you're saying, I think it's interesting what you say is, you, if I'm understanding it correctly, is that, okay, one of, one of the narratives, because I, I think you guys have different narratives. There's not just one you know monolithic narrative that that seems to be coming out of 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 radical and the different things that you do but different different stories different narratives yeah what am i see is that you want to ensure that it's not just reactionary you know about okay i'm reacting to this system with you know putting another system yeah great but the story that emerges and i i wouldn't shy away from um 
the, the creation of a narrative that is about connection and about, as you say, who we are and, and what we value as human beings and, and, and how to manifest that. And I wouldn't shy away because all narrative needs to be, all story needs to be intentionally created. Okay? We should never just, I, 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 I say this um, in a sort of a utilitarian way, it's like we should never just show up and talk, no? Uh, I think it's very important that we, that we shape our ideas in a way that, that people can understand them, the people that we need to understand them. It's very important, yeah? And so one of the, one of the, the things that we do as, as, as human beings, as communicators, is very often we communicate to people as if we were communicating to ourselves. I do it, yeah. it's, it's very common, yeah? Yeah. When you intentionally create something like, let's say, one of those stories and narratives that you guys are, 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 are in very much involved in, yeah, I mean, you inhabit beautifully um, and also through your actions, in that, that, that consciously creating the words, yeah, uh, and the metaphors to communicate to people about that. I think is absolutely necessary and very important in this sort of revolution of, of meaning. And then another one could be um, maybe more juxtaposed with the current system if you want to actually talk about fiat thinking because you are drawing from a current system. So I think that could be a very interesting narrative to, I mean, you all, you all have been working on this for a long time, but to keep on working and to keep on refining and to keep on helping people understand uh, because your fiat metaphor is, is very powerful. And the more you help people understand that and to, to be able to use it themselves and even know the origin of that, I think is great, important. And it juxtaposes itself very naturally with the current system. And, and, and so I think that's fine too. So I think you guys have several emerging narratives here that are very important. What does that make sense? Uh, it does, it does. And thank you for that because that, that, that adds a lot of clarity for me. One of the th ways that I use the language that I often use when, when talking about what you've just described is framing hmm. uh, that, that we need to frame the conversation. Uh, we need to frame the story. We need to frame the way we engage with one another, because if we, if we don't, we're not helping ourselves and we're not helping connect to the folks that we're, we're trying to connect with or make meaning with. Another way of saying that is we don't have a we we don't have we often argue about who the audience is. It, it, it's not something that we thought about you know with clarities, but go ahead. Well, no, I mean, me go ahead because uh, that's we're, that's, we're that's sorry, not, I, no, I th I'm sorry. Um, um, Jose, did I cut you off? No, I, I yeah, I wanted to finish that thought because sorry. the the framing, the framing idea and and the storyline idea and uh, the you know, the narrative, I think they're all it, 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 you know, I also love the work uh, of George and and. And I think he describes it very well, which is every story we tell is really about touching upon other mental images we already have. It's about connecting these, these pre-existing things that are in our heads and being able to bring them forward, not so much about what we're telling people, but about reigniting the things that already pre-exist in our heads. And thus the reason knowing who the audience is is so critical because we're not telling our story. We're using words that connect to the story they already have to then build from that. Yes. Beautifully said, absolutely beautifully said. If you decide to leave radically, you can definitely come work on my team because I think you'd be a wonderful facilitator. That was wonderful. Okay, so let me just add to that, um, to, 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 to give some more nuance to that. Um, what, let me quote uh, Cic uh, Cicero, uh, Cic Cicero, in English, how do you say Cicero? Um, Cicero? 
Cicero. But, yeah. Um, Cicero said, if you want to persuade me, you must first think my thoughts, feel my feelings, and speak my words. Beautiful. So that's sort of pre-lake off there. Uh, what we want to do is we want to connect with the ideas, the, if you want to go into the neurocircuitry, the neurocircuitry that is in people's brains that causes them to have a frame of ideas and then a worldview, we want to just stop for a moment and look at our audience and ask ourselves some questions about them, okay? So going back, Matt, to what you were talking about is to your audience. I'll help you guys figure that out one day. You do a little bit of lab with me and we'll, we'll, we'll look at your audience because that's the first step of what we do and the method that we teach people. Um, the very first step is looking at our audience and doing an, uh, an audience map where we ask ourselves questions about this audience and we answer them, we look at them, we understand what are the resistances? What are, their, what, are, what are the motivations they have with this theme? What are the problems they see? What are the things they say? Um, and that activates what I like to call radical empathy, okay? And it's a very operative type of empathy. All right, so that's very important. In order to be able to then to connect to the worldview, connect to the fears, the vulnerabilities, the, the, what they know, what they don't know uh, about a certain theme of an audience. Then when you do that in the construction of your story and narrative, because that's our starting point, that's always our starting point, it's the most powerful starting point there is, okay? When you connect in the shaping of your story, because when you look at your audience and you understand your audience, you're already starting to shape your narrative and story because you already have a lot of great information and you've come out of yourself, you come outside of yourself. I call it the revolution, but like a revolution, you know, as an orbit, okay? so. Then you start structuring the words and you start structuring your, your, your narrative and you always have your audience with you. Now you're going to connect with them because you have taken the time to look at what their, look at their map, look at their worldview. Then when you connect with them, as you were saying, Jose, once you connect with them and they feel seen, they feel heard just in your narrative or story, then you can take them someplace else as well. That's the key. You can take them someplace else. You can take them to new understanding. You can take them to new ideas, to build new circuitry, to build new frames. First connecting with them and then taking them someplace else. And that's key. And it works over and over and over. Was why it's so powerful. And it's and it's quite emp empathetic. I mean, it's, it's, it's this using this radical empathy um, in a way to help you construct language and story and narrative. It's really difficult, really, really difficult to be that empathetic. Um, we just came out of a meeting where one of the people in the meeting was, was pitching this idea and it was very definite. He talked about money a lot. And uh, I stayed quiet for a long time because... I knew what was, what was going to come out of my mouth was not going to be constructive. <clears throat> I thought I knew something about uh, this fellow, but it wasn't helping. Mm -hmm. um, so even if we identified like the three extremes of the, of the audiences that we want to talk to, um, what you what you think you're, they're going to ask, or you think they're, they feel, or, or the quote of us, the sort of quote, you know, it's just think by thoughts. Those thoughts, we don't know. Okay. We have to find somebody from that audience to tell us what is it that they're thinking of. And I'm, I'm thinking back at, at, the, at the one tr tr trillion dollars you got out of the Bush administration. Um, for for healthcare, that's that's ridiculous. So so, how how do you find that out? It's 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 not as difficult as you think. First of all, I mean the the, the method that we use, and maybe you guys will do a lab one day and you'll see because um, it's it's about helping people ask questions. Okay, asking questions is is the key. Uh, the questions you ask and the questions you don't ask gets us to where we are right now in this world, in this society, in this conversation. Um, so it's about the questions you ask in the, in the, in the first, in the first, um, 
the first tool which I have here, for example, is is we, we do it online as well, but I just happen to have paper copies. This is the audience map. Okay, we know more about our audiences than we know we know. Okay, and that's because uh -huh. we we have observed things about our audiences. We have we have taken information in, but we might not recall it because we don't ask ourselves questions. When we stop to ask ourselves a question. Huh? We can get to some answers that are pretty interesting and pretty, pretty um, faithful. Now, if we don't know anything, anything about our audience at all, yeah, then we might want to do a little bit of research beforehand. Okay, fine. But mostly, if somebody you know is a male that's forty-five years old and he's white and he's American and he did it and he does and that and he has this position as a director, blah 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 blah. blah you can probably know some things about this group of people, yeah? Um, what could be with their resistances? What could be the motivation for them to listen? What could be the problems they see? We can also do a little bit of research, but a lot of times it's not necessary because we just want to start to put ourselves in their reality, okay? Not exactly know, because Cicero does not exactly know every thought they think, no. But to get out of ours and start to think about theirs. And that is something that I do over and over and over with people, or me and my team, um, as we help them build a story narrative that could be about their, it could be about a service that they have. It could be about a, 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 a change they're doing in the organization. It could be about a transformation they're doing. It could be about their strategy. It could be about, you, know, you can write stories and narratives about anything that's important to create shared meaning about. And that's where we always start, yeah? And it's always the radical point of, okay, now we can start to frame, we can start to use a little bit of language. We know we can address some of the resistances that we have seen that we might have already. So answering your question, Matt, we don't know exactly what they would ask us, but we can start to address that because we've simply taken the time to ask ourselves new questions about them and actually, and map it out, oh, yeah? Okay. And, and you can do this with people who you feel ideologically aligned with. You can do this with groups of people that you don't feel any ideological alignment with. Um, th that's not the question. That's why we had so much success in Washington, I think, is because we're trying to align ourselves ideologically, my team of, of lobbyists, uh, with the current administration's ideology. No, we were looking at it and saying, what? What can we say? What can be our argument fitting in to, 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 to help them to, so they can resonate with this? And then we can take them where we need them to go. Um, and, it, and it's not about, it doesn't have anything to do with, I don't know, it doesn't even have anything to do with liking people or inviting them over to dinner. It, it, it's about trying to understand something about that reality so you can communicate better with them according to their reality. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. That's that's a really powerful way to to look at because I think very often what we try to do is change people. Mm. Right? The focus is often we say, "Oh, what we want to do is change them so they'll want to do this thing in this way if we could just change them." And what, what I'm hearing you say is it's not about changing them. They are who they are. It's about reaching them where yes. they're at. Beautifully said. Absolutely and, beautifully said. I'm probably going to quote you um, one day on that one, I have to say. So that it's really nice José Leal. That's José Leal. Punto com. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, that, that was very nicely said. And um, if I could just take a moment to say, because you have... You all decided to call this um, building the story from the inside, no? And and I think it's beautiful that you all chose that as, as it's one of our it's one of the things that we say in in, in my organization. But you chose that, and it it struck a chord with you, right? Right. Why did that? Why does that strike a chord? I'd like to know why does that sentence or or phrase strike a chord with you guys? For me. The, the reason we called it radical was because we think that what's happening is that the world is moving away from external force. 
as a as a means of guiding where we go next as a society as as humanity and moving towards us as the force that is doing the that moving forward and and to do that is to recognize that the root of all of society is us and radical means root and so the inside is that us, right? And, and so for anything that we think that we're going to be doing as a transformation of the world, a movement towards something that is not bound to the inside, then we're just playing the same forward. We're playing the same game forward. How do we bind it to us, to what drives us to the motivation to the to the underlying reason for who we are okay that was so powerful and i don't know if you have that written down just like that but i want you to take this 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 uh filmation you don't say that in english <laughs> it's like grabacion. this video this video, thank you. I want you to take this video and I want you to take that those words right after the question I asked you and I want you to write them down verbatim, okay? And that needs to be published just like that. It's absolutely beautiful, very beautiful, okay? That is a very important piece of narrative. You probably got it written down somewhere before, but if you don't, great. And so you're answering the question about why you like so much building the story from the inside. Matt, mm, Jose, like what, what, what? what what is it about? I mean, I, I love the definition you just gave of radical, beautiful. But what about building the story from the inside strikes you? Or you could just continue with that. I'm just very curious, and I can tell you what it means in, in a minute we have ask that. It, ask it another way. I, don't, I didn't quite Well, like, because it was, you were struck with building the story from the inside because, you know, you had many different uh, phrases that you could use to, to mm -hmm. call this, you know, this, 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 uh, program that we're doing today and you chose um building the story from the inside and i got a sense that that really struck something with you guys well it really to, vibrated with you to to in a sense review what, what jose has said not as beautifully but you know i'll I repeat it um the change is fundamental is is it goes back to the root of what you are the the radix of what you are and our society doesn't want us there okay doesn't doesn't at all want us there so we're curious and playful and and toss things around and want to throw sometimes tomatoes to the wrong things or whatever society doesn't want any of that they want rules and they okay. want boxes and the smaller boxes the 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 better so our thing was you got to throw that shit out and start from where you're at. Okay, okay, okay. So you're seeing the inside as the inside of the person. That's beautiful too because building a story from the inside is great because it's the inside of the person, but it's also the inside of an organization, the inside yes. of, yeah. uh, of, 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 of a team, meaning that when you build a story with a, with a, when you build a story for an organization or, or, or a group or a team or a company or a community, uh, instead, instead of have, handing it off to an ad agency, which ad agencies do great work, that's, that's not the problem, but instead of handing it off to an ad agency, you start to construct with a team of people from the inside this story, and that makes it so much more powerful and what it does is it transforms the people um, and empowers the people who are building it together and and it, uh, if they are directors of a, of a of a company they're managers inside of a company they're activists uh, that are working on a particular issue it's a neighborhood they're doing some work on social justice or it's um a team of people who are in a startup or it's your team of people at Radical, right. people start to, first of all, they build this, they're building this narrative and the story. They're guided by the tools, of course. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not in free fall. Um, they're using the creativity. They're using some talents they might have that are being unlocked or maybe they have been silenced for a while or, or put are sleeping. 
Um, they ask questions together of themselves, yeah, the team, because they go through the tools, they have to ask themselves the questions, and that builds new types of thinking. So people, when they're building a story together or building a narrative together, it's a hugely empowering experience on different levels because they're doing new types of thinking together. They're asking themselves questions together. They're coming to answers together. They're feeling a part of it. Things change that are unseeable from the beginning. You don't yeah. really know what's going to happen. Yeah. I know, my team knows we're going to get to a narrative or story because that's what the method and the tools will help you do. But we don't know what kinds of things will come out and emerge and, and, and be seen and become visible with this team. They build the story. Then they're a part of it. They're a part of it. Yeah. And they're not disassociated with it. And they have unlocked and activated new types of thinking. And those new types of thinking and those questions that have been asked and that creativity that has been that has been ignited and used and and, and nourished um, will continue. After my team is gone, after the narrative or story has been built. And that's also something that I think, uh, as an activist, uh, I feel very happy about. I, I like working in, in a corporate environment for that reason as well, because I'm working with human beings, yeah? And they're activating new ways of thinking. And when they build a story together, a narrative together about a service, about something that, that they're doing in their business, about a strategy, sometimes it's the first time they've ever built anything together. Yeah. That's quite beautiful, that's quite beautiful. Absolutely. And, and, and I think the power of the narrative that you're describing when built that way, uh, back to Mr. Lakoff, um, it doesn't just change the words. It changes how our minds work. Yeah. And nice. when it changes it at that root level, again, back to root, when it changes it at that root level, we are now much more in sync because we share the same story, not just the words and just the ideas of practical, I'm going to do X and you're going to do Y. And I'm not sure why you're doing X and I'm not sure why you're doing Y, but we don't have a foundational story to support the work that we're doing. Exactly right. That's exactly right. And that's it's very well articulated. And I can tell that you have... I can tell this comes from experience as well, because I know you both have a, a experience in, in, in the corporate world. And sometimes when people build a story together in the corporate world, and I work with big corporations, sometimes or smaller corporations, I know that the building of that narrative or story about a service or something, but because something happens in the way you just described it, sometimes it actually saves the, 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 the organization from going under. It actually can save. It actually can bring oh, yeah. new strength. No. Yep. yep. Makes sense. But 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 at the same time, in a big organization, it doesn't have to be big. It, no. In an organization that's been built from the ground up to be fiat, those people that had never built anything together now they build a story. Um, have a very small chance of changing the organization unless it re re repeat this over and over and over and over. Um, so th that, I mean, we, we come to the conclusion that large established organizations are not the place for us to start. And maybe we're full of shit, but- But when you say you know, us, who do you mean us to start? What do you mean? Jose? Jose and I. Oh, okay, you guys. Right. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see yes. what you mean. So, mm -hmm. so um, because of there's so much pressure coming down on these people to, you know, produce things by a certain date and produce things that make money and produce things that make money and and and, and stay in your in your in your little box. So I'll give you I'll give you an example that mm -hmm. that I've given over and over. And that is, at one point, I collaborated. I made the mistake of collaborating with another manager. It was another director. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I was talking to my boss about something completely different. And he said, 
oh, you're, you're, working, you're working with blah, blah, blah. And said, so, yeah, yeah. And in fact, and before I could say anything, he said, don't do that. That's, that's not, see, I mean, I don't care, but other people are not seeing it well. It's like you're making them look good. And I, I was baffled by it. I was totally baffled by that. I was a lot younger, and I think I had hair and, <laughs> and stuff like that. And um, but I was, how could talking to somebody, collaborating with somebody, be seen as bad? But in a place where you have to be silent, and that's one of the pressures that you're getting to be silent. Collaborating with somebody is is bad news. So. Um, we decided not to go there, but you know, you you're welcome to change our mind. No, no, no that, that makes per that ma that makes sense for for you for your objectives. It makes perfect sense, and that's very painful. It must have been painful for that Matt with hair to have 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 heard that and felt that, and I can feel that pain of just like it's so it's anti human, it's anti tribe, it's anti yes, I I I, I can see that, and that's why. I do, I do work in corporate environments and I also work with activists. You know, I have right now uh, uh, somebody from, from one of our facilitators. He's doing some work, bless you, with, uh, in Mexico, micro labs for um, uh, uh, future scenarios of social justice. Yeah, and he, he's using the storyboard method to help n a group of citizens build narratives about that. No, so wonderful. And I work, can work, you know, and the next day I work at a, in a, at a company, in a corporation. People get out of their silos to build a narrative. Um, they build together. They see each other's creativity. Sometimes they listen to each other maybe for the first time and hear each other. Activate new tools and something changes for them on the inside. And I don't know what changes for the organization except they have a great narrative or story and they have an empowered group of people. If something changes for those people individually and I consider that to be really important yeah no I could, I could see why I'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm uh, attracted to all that I just want to say one one quick thing we're, one is we're way over time <laughs> which is great it doesn't get it doesn't matter we can keep talking for two hours and kind of <laughs> and, and the other one is uh, I am in a, um, Send me your address, and I'll send you. Yeah, I was going to say, Yamina, you, you've got one. If you if you send us our address, your address, uh, Yamina, uh, we've spoken to her a few months ago, and she's uh, a member of the tribe. So uh, absolutely. Um, I, I personally have one more question, um, Jennifer, uh, and and maybe we could uh, think about wrapping it up, but. The work that you do, the thing you've described, seems to me that it's what human nature, what humanity has been doing since the beginning of time. Yep. And it's talking about what's important to us, building meaning about that, and using that narrative, that story to maintain the glue of the very fabric of our community. Yes. yes. And, and I, I appreciate that you've turned it into a business. I appreciate that you've turned it into something that is um, approachable by, by folks today in our world as it is. Um, but is it, is it not, already what you're doing is is a fundamental part of humanity to start with uh, you're you you've made possible the codifying of something that exists in us and and should be out there in all organizations in all forms of collaboration oh, yeah. um, but you're you're doing it you're bringing it to light in in the special places that you're working in. Yes, and and you know when you talk about that, I'm thinking of like the you know cave paintings, and it, which I you know I love. Uh, la, uh, I don't know how to say this in English. Las pinturas rupestres, and and um, 
you know, when people were writing, drawing stories on the side on rocks or inside of a cave or on other surfaces, we lived in such a radically different uh, 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 type of, of society, tribe, of s small group of people. And then look at our world now. Mm, those innate, we are innate lovers of, of stories. Matter of fact, neuroscience has helped us see that we have a part of our brain that is a, in the left hemisphere that helps us to take information in and actually turn it into a story. It's called the interpreter, and we call it the story mind, which is why we call our organization the story mind. But that has become and so, so diluted and there's so much, so much stimuli and there's so much information, there's so much noise that now people need um, a way to be able to do this intentionally, to create shared meaning with a group of people, with intentionality and with, with a process. Because no longer can we go to a side of a rock and start to paint something and a few of the people that we might live with a group of 25 people can see it and we can understand and we can show them that's not our situation anymore yeah so it's much more complex and, and yeah. i have a book about this and that there's, there's some chapters about that how we got to where we are but uh, i want to contribute what, what is the book show us the book uh, do you have the it's book called, it's, called, it's kind of far away <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I have it in, in, in um, Chinese and in Spanish. Piensa comunica y comunica tus ideas con the storyboard method. But I do, there's a lot of theory in here about how we got to this, to the way, to where we are. Um, and so it's not, there's, there's nothing, yes, it's an eight. Right. Shaping ideas into a story and needing ideas to be shaped into a meaningful story. But, but creating them is not, is, 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 is not innate right now. And, it's, and I want to give people that, that ability to, right. to do it intentionally. Beautiful. Uh, I truly have enjoyed this conversation. I think yep. it's been uh, very enlightening and I think very helpful for us. Uh, but I think for everyone because without stories we can't move forward and so uh jennifer thank you so much for taking your time uh the time you invested in in researching whether this was worth doing the time that you spent in understanding our gibberish uh and uh and the time you've taken today to to sit with us for uh, as long as you have so thank you so much and the time you take to make the invisible visible thank you that's very important. Thank you. Very, very. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you all for, for, for your mission. Um, uh, this has been a, a great conversation. It's one of the best conversations I've had in a while. So I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your inquisitive minds. And uh, I'll help you map your audience if you want. Just uh, Yes. Yeah. We want. Okay. We want. All right. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Awesome. So... I, I get to announce the next week's uh, guest, and his name is Rohit Bagul, and he's with Case Point. There he is. And he's with Case Point, and the topic is Shaping the Future Through Agile People Operations. Now, that's a nominal topic, and but of course, we'll turn into a how does it map into the non fiat radical. Um, concept I and mean, we've had some experience with agile we hope it's different um so uh, looking forward to it and, and thank you very much for everything you've done and uh, what you're going to do for us and stuff like that and um next time i go to spain i'll make sure that i stop and visit please do please do thank you matt thank you jose thank you gracias Jennifer. muchas gracias adios